True Life in God, International Day of Prayer for the Unification of the Dates of Easter, to foster Christian unity when the world needs it most. True Life in God is happy to welcome you to join in the first annual worldwide 24-hour vigil before Jesus in the Eucharist. This event is a response to Jesus' appeal to mankind to unite the dates of Easter. It will be live streamed with 48 countries participating. This day of prayer will bring much solace to the sacred hearts of Jesus and Mary and will engender many graces for the world. Please join us by clicking the link below. The True Life in God messages enjoy the Church's official seals of approval, the Imprimatur Henihil Obstat. These seals guarantee to the readers immunity from error concerning the Church's faith and morals, and they are a guarantee to the reader that these writings may be placed and disseminated in churches. To begin, let us go to one of the meditations from True Life in God, November 27, 1996. Jesus reveals, My heart grieves continuously to watch those in my house who lack sincerity and who do not work in my spirit for the unification of the dates of Easter. I ask you to pray for them that my Father may give them a change of mind, so that once their eyes are opened by my Holy Spirit, they will repent and recognize their error, which prevented them from seeing the truth. Pray for them that this spirit of pride in them, keeping them separated from the truth, leaves them and brings them back to their senses. So the first thing the Lord asks of us tonight through this November 27th, 1996 message is that we pray that those who do not labor for the unification of the dates of Easter may receive our prayers. He asks that these individuals' eyes may be opened, hearts may be docile through our prayers, which engender grace, so that God may take our prayers and touch their hearts by this means. He also states on <clears throat> October 25th, 1991. Am I, Father, Jesus is speaking to his Father, am I, Father, to drink? one more season of the cup of their division, or will they at least unify the Feast of Easter, alleviating part of my pain and sorrow? So here we understand that Jesus suffers because of the two dates of Easter. And this is something I don't think many of us give much attention to. We do know that Christ is asking that there be one date, but that it makes him suffer that there be two dates. This is a something that we don't talk about much. But we must remember that the body of Christ is a mystical body. St. Paul speaks of this. And this mystical body of Christ is divided when the dates of Easter are divided. How is this possible? Christ is the head of his church, St. Paul says. We are the members of this mystical body. When a few members of this body are suffering through the season of Lent, offering up sacrifices, doing penance, mortifying the senses, Christ participates in that offering up of the sacrifice, of the penance, of the mortification. Did not Christ say what you've done to the least of these you've done to me? Does not St. Paul say when one member suffers, they all suffer? So there is this network of grace and 
participation of Christ through grace with the members of his mystical body. Now, when one group or several members of this mystical body are going through Lent, while at the same time other members of that same body are rejoicing in Easter, how do you think that makes God feel? Well, we don't really know, do we, unless God tells us, which he just did on October 25th, 1991. He also says the same thing on October 14th, 1991. He suffers because of this division in his own body. And again, the suffering is produced by his participation in what each member is experiencing as a church. You see, Christ appointed apostles to guide, to teach, to administer the sacraments, to sanctify the church. When these leaders of the church that Christ appointed are offering up sacrifices and penance and the, and the rest of the flock with them, while another group of leaders is rejoicing and the flock with them, the, the body is divided. And Christ experiences this rupture or this inconsistency uh, of the body not all participating at the same time in the Passion, Good Friday, the Resurrection, Easter Sunday. So Christ is imploring us. He's not just asking us to unite the dates. He's begging us because he wants his suffering to be alleviated. He says on October 14th, 1991, will I, brother, one more season go through the pain I have been going through year after year? Or will you give me rest this time? Am I going to drink one more season, the cup of your division? Or will you rest my body? See his mystical body. Will you rest my body and unify for my sake the Feast of Easter? He doesn't say for our sake, he says for his sake, because he's suffering. He's asked, God is asking us to comfort him. In unifying the date of Easter, you will alleviate my pain, brother. And you will rejoice in me and I in you. And I will have the sight of many restored. Now, how is the unifying of the dates of Easter going to restore the sight of many? Well. Number one, if we have one common date, we join together in the feast day of divine mercy, which is a plenary indulgence of all sin and punishment. This is just one of the ways in which Christ's pain will be alleviated and the sight of many will be restored. Millions and millions of souls in the East do not partake of the feast of divine mercy because the dates of Easter are divided. If the dates are united, then this feast day, I'm sure will start to be respected by the East as well, because it's the first, this plenary indulgence of divine mercy Sunday is the first Sunday after Easter, right? And this is one of the ways in which we can help restore the sight of many, bring many back to the church through God's mercy. Now, we sometimes people wonder, why do we have two dates? Did we always have one date? Was there one date in the beginning? And if there was, how did the split happen? Well, both Orthodox and Catholics, before the, the split of the East and West, which is called the Eastern Western Schism 1054, have from the time of the Council of Nicaea agreed upon one common date of Easter. Okay, so one must note that the text of the Easter decree of the Council of Nicaea has not been preserved. So oral transmission of its existence is what we have from tenable sources. But there are several fragments of the reality of this decree through the writings of historians like Eusebius, who in his work, The Life of Constantine, Constantine addresses the decree of Nicaea. 
and states, this feast ought to be kept by all and in every place on one and the same day. So these, this source of, not, of Eusebius, along with other historian sources, confirm that at the Council of Nicaea, there were, um, I think, four teachings that had to be preserved. Number one, Easter must be celebrated by all throughout the world on the same Sunday all Christians. This is before the split of East and West. Two, this Sunday, when all churches are celebrating Easter, must follow the 14th day of the Paschal moon. Three, this Paschal moon was to be accounted the Paschal moon whose 14th day followed the spring equinox. And four, some provision should be made um, for determining the proper date of Easter and communicating it to the rest of the world through science, astronomers who follow the, the moon's pattern and uh, can, do, can approximate an accuracy of the date of Easter. Remember, it's not so much the scientific accuracy of the date of Easter as it is all the church celebrating one common date that they agree upon. This same principle applies to all feasts in the church. Do you think that Christ was born on December 25th? Probably not, but that's not that important. What matters is that we are all celebrating that feast day together. Do you think that Mary's birthday was actually on December 8th? But Amidjigorius just said it was in August. So it's not so much the exact date we celebrate, but that we all do it in common while trying our best to approximate as close as we can when through science, astronomy, we believe it may have happened. Um, now, when the Council of Nicaea's ruling on the proper time for Easter, the proper date, there were still some difficulties because we had at the time the Julian calendar. Well, the East still has that Pope Gregory in the West when he re tried to calculate more accurately the scientifically and astronomically correct date of Easter um, changed the calendar. Now, it gets a little bit mathematical here, but I wish you to understand why this happened, okay, without going into too much detail. Um, let me state this first. The actual date of Easter is not a doctrinal reality. It's a disciplinary reality. Why do I say this? Because doctrine never changes. Discipline changes often. So the date of Easter is a disciplinary reality. It can be changed. Just like um, communion in the hand, on the tongue, just like kneeling or genuflecting during the consecration, just like uh, married or celibate priesthood, these things can change. You know, Paul in the scripture said a bishop should be married once. So Peter was married and he was the Pope. So these things can change. Now in the West, they change that where there's celibacy enforced. I think in the East, well, most of the East, they can be married before they're ordained. The point is this, doctrine never changes, discipline changes. The date of Easter is a disciplinary reality. Um, now with regard to the mathematics and all this. Some wonder why Pope Gregory changed the calendar. He chose to do so because he wanted to reform. He wanted to reform the, uh, the actual scientific date. And the reason for this is that the Julian calendar, which the whole church followed up until Pope Gregory, first implemented by Julius Caesar in 46 BC, the Roman emperor was based on a Roman, a Roman emperor's system that miscalculated the length of the solar ray by 11 minutes, okay? But it was relatively accurate. So 11 minutes is pretty close, you know? Um, and this concerned Pope Gregory because it meant that Easter traditionally observed on March 21st fell farther away with each year, 11 set minutes, kept moving, uh, falling away more and more. 
from the spring equinox with each passing year. So Gregory employed an Italian scientist by the name of Lilius to develop a new calendar that devised the variation that adds the leap day in years, divisible by four. Now, even Lilius did not get it right. <laughs> even though his, his calculation of adding a leap year was ingenious, um, his system was still off by 26 seconds, okay? As a result, and in the years since Gregory introduced this calendar in 1582, mul multiply that 26 seconds every year for, since 1582, a discrepancy of several hours comes into play. So by the year four, let's say 4,909 in the future, the Gregorian calendar will be off a full day ahead of the solar year. This, I know it's a bit mathematical, but we do know that um, uh, the, the, the date that was agreed upon by Nicaea was observed by all and is still observed by the East. They haven't changed it. Um, <clears throat> so what matters here is that we stop the suffering of Christ. We help alleviate and comfort him because he is experiencing pain by the separation every year. And uh, this is what we plan on doing up on this coming Sunday, May 29th through 30th, when on Eastern Daylight Time at 9 a.m. we expose the Blessed Sacrament in the monasteries and we adore Jesus throughout the world. So far, thanks be to God and the goodwill of those who welcome the invitation of Jesus to pray for the unification of the dates of Easter. We have hundreds of people participating of over 50 countries throughout the world. And each, a series of groups of people from different countries will be covering each hour for 24 hours. And this is the first time in church history, in human history, that people have got, gotten together internationally to pray for the date of Easter for 24 hours nonstop. So this is really big because all heaven is going to be paying attention. Why? Because Jesus wants this. And whatever Jesus wants, all heaven wants as well. Remember in heaven, they all angels and saints have one common goal. They have different talents, different gifts, different degrees of holiness, but they all follow the will of God and also follow the desires of God. And when God is wanting us to unite the dates of Easter, and then we respond to that call by praying as Jesus asks, all heaven and all the saints will participate in that prayer. So we are going to, in a holy way, storm heaven so that God may receive our prayer on behalf of all those who do not pray. So that during these 24 hours, we may be praying for those who do not work for the date of Easter being unified, that their eyes may be open to the truth, as Jesus says, and that they may, be, may repent and convert. And that through this unification of the dates of Easter, many souls will be brought back and helped by God's grace. True Life in God, International Day of Prayer for the Unification of the Dates of Easter. To foster Christian unity when the world needs it most. True Life in God is happy to welcome you to join in the first annual worldwide 24-hour vigil before Jesus in the Eucharist. This event is a response to Jesus' appeal to mankind to unite the dates of Easter. It will be live streamed with 48 countries participating. This day of prayer will bring much solace to the sacred hearts of Jesus and Mary and will engender many graces for the world. Please join us by clicking the link below. The True Life in God messages enjoy the church's official seals of approval, the Imprimatur Henihil Obstat. These seals guarantee to the readers immunity from error concerning the Church's faith and morals 
and they are a guarantee to the reader that these writings may be placed and disseminated in churches. <laughs>